Hello everyone, my name is Brant Kudrowski and this Organic Chemistry Lab video covers the hydroboration and oxidation of one octene experiment. This is part one of the experiment and part one of that, the pre-lab lecture. Procedure for this experiment will involve reading the procedure in the lab manual, viewing this narrated PowerPoint presentation, and then watching the video on how to carry out the experiment. This is a two-part experiment. It's going to be carried out over two weeks. Each part of the experiment has a separate quiz on saplinglearning.com, but there's only one lab notebook and post-lab template file on Google Docs for the entire experiment. Complete it over the next two weeks and then submit it to Canvas when you're done. There's only one lab homework for this experiment and it's on saplinglearning.com as well. Some safety items for today's experiment. We're going to be working with borane THF today, which is a new reagent and we've not used it before. And it's moisture sensitive and air sensitive. It reacts violently with water to produce flammable hydrogen gas. Here's the equation. This is borane THF. This is water. The product, hydrogen gas, is very flammable. Also, this ether is flammable as well. This is tetrahydrofuran, and tetrahydrofuran is a cyclic ether. It's very volatile and flammable. It's also irritating to the skin, eyes, and mucous membranes. You should be careful when using it and avoid exposure. Finally, use care when working with needles. The hydroboration oxidation of one octene experiment is a two-step process. It's a sequence that involves converting an alkene into an alcohol. Here's the overall reaction. We start with one octene. First we'll do the hydroboration step with borane THF, BH3THF. That's this week's experiment. Then next week's experiment involves treating that with hydrogen peroxide and sodium hydroxide. The result is going to be two regioisomeric alcohols. In part one of the experiment, borane adds across the double bond, the CC double bond of one octene with syn addition. Both the borane and the hydrogen atoms add from the same face of the alkene, and we'll talk about that. This is going to give an alkyl borane intermediate. Then in step two, hydrogen peroxide and hydroxide react with the alkyl borane intermediates created in the first step to convert them into alcohols. There are two possible constitutional isomer products for this reaction. There's one octanol and two octanol, and we'll notice the selectivity difference in the end products. The first step is this week's experiment, hydroboration. In the first step, borane will add across the CC double bond of one octene with syn addition. Both the boron and the hydrogen atoms add from the same face of the alkene, and so there's two possible constitutional isomer products. Here's how one of them works. One option is for boron to line up with the end carbon of the alkene, the terminal carbon. The boron and the hydrogen add from the same face of the alkene. I'm drawing some dotted lines here to show where the new bonds are going to be forming. The result is a monoalkyl borane where the boron is attached to the end of the chain. The same reaction can happen but with a different selectivity if the boron lines up with the alkene on the more substituted carbon here. So here boron and the more substituted carbon are lined up. This is also a syn addition because both the hydrogen and the boron are adding from the same face. And again, when the electrons flow, we're going to get a monoalkyl borane product. But here the boron's attached to a different carbon. One important thing about borane is it can react with three alkenes. Each one of the hydrogens on boron is reactive with a different alkene. So here's how that process works. There can be a syn addition with one alkene product that produces a monoalkyl borane, shown here. Another alkene can react with that monoalkyl borane and add across the borane to generate a dialkyl borane. That can react a step further with another alkene to produce something called a trialkyl borane. So the bottom line is each BH3 molecule can react with three alkenes. And it's important to remember this when you're doing yield calculations because the stoichiometry in this reaction isn't a simple one-to-one -one ratio between borane and the alkene. Here we're going to calculate moles of reactants used. These are just some tips and hints. You can calculate the moles of each reagent used in the reaction and Use the amount specified in parts one and two of the procedure. Here are some hints. Use the density and the molecular weight to calculate moles of one octene. You're going to measure out a volume and you can use density to convert volume into mass and then you use the molecular weight of one octene to convert mass into moles. For the borane THF solution and sodium hydroxide solutions, you're given a volume to use and a molarity of solution. So to calculate moles of those, you simply multiply the volume times the molarity and just making sure your units match and you'll get moles. For the 30% hydrogen peroxide, I suggest you use the volume of the solution that you'll be using and that is found in the procedure and use its molarity, which I will tell you is 9.79 molar. That's moles per liter. 
don't use the coefficients in the balanced equation to calculate the moles of each substance that you use. This is a common mistake. You use the coefficients in the balanced equation later on when you're, cal when you're calculating theoretical yield. And when you're answering questions in the post-lab assignment regarding moles, make sure you show your work. This slide talks about limiting reagent and theoretical yield. You're going to want to use the following balanced equations for calculating the limiting reagent in the reactions producing 2-octanol and 1-octanol. Keep in mind that the coefficients aren't simple one-to-one -one ratios. These two equations are basically identical. The difference is that the product alcohol that comes out is a little different. Three moles of 1-octene react with one mole of borane THF, three moles of peroxide, and one mole of sodium hydroxide to produce three moles of 2-octanol, one mole of sodium tetrahydroxyborate, and THF. The other equation is identical except for the product is one octanol. Each product can have its own balanced equation. Next, determine the limiting reagent in the reaction producing one octanol and in the reaction producing two octanol. Here's a hint. Determine how much alcohol product could be produced from each of the four reagents. Use the moles of each reagent that you calculated previously along with the coefficients in the balanced equation to determine which reagent yields the smallest amount of the product alcohol in each reaction. That one would be the limiting reagent. The next slide will go through an example of that kind of calculation and then you can use this as a model in your own calculations. As an example, suppose that you use the following moles of each reagent. 1 octene, 0.354 moles, sodium borohydride, 0.101 moles, peroxide, 0.342 moles, and hydroxide, 0.157 moles. Use these mole amounts then and the coefficients in the balanced equation to set up four theoretical yield calculations for the production of 2 octanol. We can't predict which one will be the limiting reagent right offhand, so we're gonna calculate the limiting reagent based on each one of them. We'll assume that each one is the limiting reagent. We'll determine how much alcohol we could get from each, and whichever one is smallest will be our limiting reagent. Here's the equation that we're gonna use. Three moles of one octene react with one mole of borane THF in the first step, three moles of peroxide in the second step, along with one mole of sodium hydroxide in the second step, to give three moles of two octanol and one mole of sodium tetrahydroxyborate, along with a molecule of THF. So let's set up and do these reagents one at a time. First, let's consider one octene. So I put here the one octene reagent. We know we have 0.354 moles of it, and I'm holding it over one just as a placeholder. Then I'll use the ratio of the coefficients in the balanced equation. Here I've got three moles of two octanol in the numerator and three moles of one octene in the denominator. I'm getting this from the balanced equation where I can say three moles of two octanol are produced from three moles of one octene. I've got them color coded here so you can see where they're coming from. When it's set up like this, you'll know you have it right because moles of one octene will cancel and you'll be left with moles of two octanol. Then you can use the molecular weight of two octanol and that's indicated here. And when it's set up in this way, such that grams of two octanol is on top and moles of two octanol is in the bottom, then those units will cancel and you'll be left with grams of 2-octanol, which is the unit that you want. And in this case, that would yield 46.1 grams of 2-octanol. So that's how much 2-octanol we could theoretically get from that amount of alkene starting material. Let's do boring THF next. Here's the theoretical yield equation for that reagent. And notice the coefficients in the balanced equation are not a one-to-one -one ratio. We have three moles of two octanol because that's what's in the balanced equation per every one mole of boring THF. That's from the balanced equation. We can do a similar calculation with the peroxide reagent, which is a three to three ratio and also the sodium hydroxide reagent, which is a three to one ratio. In the end, we get four masses. We've got a 46.1 grams, a 39.5 grams, 44.5 grams, and 61.3 grams. And here, the one that produces the least amount of product is this one, and that came from the boring THF. So in this reaction, that's the smallest amount that we could produce, and this value is the smallest. Therefore, in this particular experiment, under these conditions, the boring THF is the limiting reagent, and the theoretical yield of the 2-octanol is 39.5 grams. Here's a picture of the apparatus that we're gonna be using today, and we'll be demonstrating this in the lab. But here are the parts. We have a balloon filled with argon, that's an inert gas. Because the boring THF is reactive with air and water, we're gonna use an inert gas in the reaction today. 
we have a valve that allows us to selectively close off or turn on the gas flow from the argon balloon. We have a needle that's poking through a rubber septum to introduce the gas into the apparatus. We've got an ice water bath here to keep the reaction cold, a drying tube that's filled with calcium sulfate, which is a drying agent. There's a thermometer adapter to allow us to connect the drying tube to the apparatus. We have a U-shaped adapter here, sometimes called a Claisen adapter. And then we have a 25 mil round bottom flask with a stir bar. The reaction is gonna take place in this round bottom flask. There are a number of new techniques that we're gonna learn in this experiment and put to use in this lab. We'll be flame drying glassware to get rid of any adsorbed water. We'll be learning to prepare and use a drying tube. We'll be using a balloon filled with an argon gas, an inert gas. We'll be purging our reaction vessel with inert gas to get rid of the oxygen and moisture that would be in the air. And then we're gonna learn how to transfer air and moisture sensitive reagents using a syringe and needle. These are some of the new things we're gonna to learn today and these will be demonstrated in the second video which shows actually carrying out the experiment. If you found this video useful, check out the next one in the series or watch the prior video and consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. My name is Brant Kudrowski. Thanks for watching.